Okay, thank you. I'm Jukka Birtle here from UAU Vida. Um, thank you, first of all, for the uh, very nice panel. I, I don't know what happened in the, in the competing sessions, but I, I certainly don't regret that I came to this panel, so thank you so much. Um, a couple of questions related to um, the papers by Mare. Uh, uh, first of all, regarding the first, um, can you elaborate on the, on the policy conclusions you can derive from that analysis regarding a South African education system? That the, uh, how should the education system be uh, reformed to, uh, to, to uh, uh, make it more prone to uh, foster uh, egalitarian distribution of earnings? Um, and, and a second question related to, your, to, to the paper on the incidence of the uh, grants in South Africa. Uh, which was presented uh, by your co-author. That the, um, I was wondering that the, um, we know that these grants must be uh, uh, financed by taxis, and, and you didn't seem to have um, uh, the incidence of taxis in the paper. So I was wondering that what was the reason for that, and, and, and if, you, if you did include those, so what would happen to the, uh, to the in, to, to, in, a, in a sense, to the full incidence of the combined tax and benefit system? It's a, it's a very uh, quick question. I, mean, it's, I, I, I echo uh, Yuka's comments. It was a great session. It's just a, a clarification question on the second paper on the differences between Brazil and South Africa. Uh, I thought first, I mean, the, you know, we heard this morning that the inequality came back big time. I think structural change is, is next. Then it's a very wise uh, choice of topic. Uh, I, I just didn't hear much about... Uh, I think one of the most fascinating aspects of uh, structural change in Brazil, and I think that, that throws a lot of light in your comparison, which is the very, very rapid growth in productivity in the agricultural sector. I mean, if you look at any measure of productivity uh, of the Brazilian agriculture between 1960 and, and, and 2010, that's 50 years, uh, you know, the astonishing bit, it's grow faster than Chinese uh, productivity. Then uh, I just would like to hear you, what are your uh, thoughts and uh, you know how much uh, I mean it illustrates your point on kind of unusual patterns of uh, structural change. But uh, you know I, I didn't see much uh, thoughts on that. I'd like to hear more. Thank you. Question for Murray. I'm curious whether your independent variable, the number of years of education, is measuring the same thing at the beginning of the period and at the end. Um, the matric results rather imply, though at least the ones I've seen, rather imply that the, the variable is, uh, changes fairly substantially over the period of time. I wonder if you could comment on that, please. Thank you. Christophe Muller from uh, the University of Aix-Marseille in France. I'm impressed by the, the breadth, the quality, the interest of all this work coming from South Africa, so I'm <laughs> happy to see that. Uh, Murray, uh, uh, um, your, your, your presentation was very nice and very clear, and, and, and it helps a lot to understand the relationship uh, uh, between inequality, income inequality, and, and, uh, and the dispersion of, of uh, education by using this, uh, this regression this uh, usual income regression or wage regression. Um, naturally, you know the, the, the main problems with this regression, huh? with the measurement of return to education, the, 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 the two main problems for a long time in the econometric literature is the, the, the probable uh, endogeneity of um, the education variable because of an observed ability, an observed motivation, measurement errors, and so on. There's a huge econometric literature on that. And also the question of selectivity, especially on, over such a, a, a long period, it's likely that well, people come in the labor market, they leave, they, they finish school, they, they migrate, etc. So, so, so it's quite complicated. And naturally, you, you, you may want to, to, to correct the estimation to try to, to, to count for, for that with typical method, uh, as usual. But also, I, I found that because your setting is so clear in the beginning, it's interesting perhaps to take on board these difficulties and to see 
how this would be modified by acknowledging this difficulty with uh, 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 the education on, on the selection. And, on, on the, I think probably it's not going to be too complicated and you may be able to find proxies to measure the impact of this, of this problem. Uh, on, the, on the second paper, uh, Joshua, um, well, at, at the end of, of, of the day, okay, you, you gave us a lot of interesting uh, uh, information on uh, South Africa and on, on Brazil. Uh, I have a little bit of difficulty to understand what do we learn about this comparison? Could you perhaps summarize in one sentence what is really the main thing that we learn by comparing Brazil on South Africa from your, from your, your, your point of view? Uh, on the third paper, um, it's very tempting to uh, try to uh, think about the issue you are looking at by uh, using treatment effect estimation instead of decomposition. So have you thought about the, the, the connection of these two kinds of, of uh, technologies? You know, there are, there are different ways of looking at the same thing. Uh, more and more people are going to uh, expect treatment effect estimates when you talk about the impact of any, any, any program. So um, you need at least to uh, position yourself in comparison to this literature. Uh, and on, the, on the final paper, um, the, this asset index, the CPA or any other uh, multivariate uh, summary uh, uh, method, uh, they are really useful and I think in the last few years we have seen a lot of work using this data which was not uh, uh, used before. Uh, and we learn a lot by, by trying to uh, uh, mobilize this information by having these aggregate in in indices. One problem with these indices is that they are data dependent. Uh, you, you, when you estimate a score, you change the data set, you have a different score. Uh, 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 and, and, and because this, you summarize dispersion of information, a lot of the, what you summarize is, is about uh, dispersion, when the inequality changes, the, 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 the formula of the score changes too. So I think there, there, there is probably a, a, um, a good reason when you work with this kind of indices to, to also parallelly uh, uh, monitor how does the score change with the change in equality uh, 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 over time or, or, uh, because you want to control for that. Thank you. My name is Ali Rashid. I'm from Cairo University, Egypt. My question is for paper number three, uh, which titled Assessing Impact of Social Grants. Uh, actually, my question is about the overemployed person's uh, impact on the inequality. It, uh, you showed that in your simulation that it increases the inequality by five times. But I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about that result. If you would disaggregate this uh, by quantiles of population, for example, maybe the overemployed persons decrease the inequality. And maybe for the fifth quantile or the sixth quantile, maybe, yeah, and you are right, it, it hits or decreases uh, decrease the inequality. So I, I, I'm not sure about the result, the final result. At the end, the total amount of a change it should be different. Thank you. I think there's one question in front here. Here. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Joel Nishtanger from South Africa. Uh, two questions based on the last presentation. Um, the one is simply about uh, the definition of assets. Um, they are private assets, but they are also public assets. Uh, privately accessed by households. So do we include those in, 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 in assessing the, 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 the asset index and, and the inequality? This would apply, for instance, to, 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 to water, sanitation, refuse removal, and, 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 and so on and so forth. That, that's the first issue. The second issue would be about... Uh, assessment of assets in rural areas and the impact of communal land tenure system. Um, 
I mean, DeSoto would, would argue that many assets of the poor are, are dead. Uh, they are dead assets. But this is even aggravated by the, the communal land tenure system so that in the rural areas those assets maybe are not only dead but also buried. How, how do we deal with that challenge? Thanks. Um, okay, so Marie, can you start with answering the, the questions and then we can go in the order of the presentations so Josh can go next. Okay, so on the education uh, paper, the, the policy conclusions, yeah, so that's a hard question. Uh, um, because hard in the following way, that uh, part of the point of the paper is to show that uh, if you're translating education change into earnings change, there's both the uh, X's, the years of schooling and what's in the realm of government and what government can do, and then there's, there's these betas, and they're squared when it comes to inequality. Uh, and those are returns, and those come out of the labour market in general. Um, uh, the, uh, I, I would say, though, that understanding uh, th that the actual cross point with the mean years, the mean earnings and the mean, uh, the years of schooling corresponding to mean earnings is quite useful in understanding how the labour market is working at any point in time. It gives you some benchmark, because otherwise you just have a furrowed brow. You have uh, the Brazilian guys uh, bemoaning the fact that they did a lot for education. And in South Africa, we bemoan the fact that we, we worked quite hard, put a lot of money into increasing years of schooling, and, uh, and were successful at that. And then, but what happened? We didn't get a, a big return. But then suddenly in Brazil come 1999, 2000, they start getting a huge return. Um, for, for sort of the same thing. It wasn't though that policy changed dramatically. So I don't think that, you know, I don't, I don't think there's a sharp uh, policy implication in a sense, but hopefully in understanding, understanding these things and understanding the zones where you're operating. So we are, like we do sit in South Africa and worry a lot now about people that we've successfully moved up into grades 10 in 11. And, uh, but we haven't given them much, actually, as citizens. Um, uh, one of the issues that does bedevil this, of course, is the focus on years of schooling, uh, as was said when uh, the question that was really asking about matric. It's asking to some extent about quality concerns. The return that you get on schooling depends upon, uh, upon quality, and that's, that's valid, and that's, that's correct. Uh, but um, So I'm not disputing that. It's a very important issue in South Africa um, and everywhere, but don't forget that these huge debates about, uh, about skill bias, technical change, and the impacts, and uh, at the end of the day, <coughs> The, the literature is coming back to years of schooling and the Brazilian story that was told. Uh, I mean, I th yeah, these issues of quality are, are fundamental, but I wouldn't want to turn the South African explanation purely on a, on a, on a quality explanation as well, when there is the demand side for labour in, in the mix as well. Um, um, the... Yeah, so obviously quality concerns. And then Christoph raised uh, a bunch of concerns about the actual earnings function itself and the endogeneity of education uh, and selection, etc. Uh, that's true. I mean, some of the results in the paper, in a sense, we're trying to use some mapping between uh, education and earnings. And we're just using the, the earnings function as, as that mapping. But uh, nonetheless, I think you're almost making the same point about the quality, but in a different way. There are many concerns about years of education and whether they are real and therefore whether you get the true estimate of the returns even. In an, and looking hard at that would, I think, is, is a very important part of this, this research program. That's, that's quite right. Um, shall I stop there on the schooling and then other people can talk? Uh, okay, thanks. So, Agriculture, agricultural sector in Brazil. Uh, yes, this is a great point. Um, 
And there is a little bit about that in the paper, and that's one of these things that got lost somewhere between the paper and, and rushing through the presentation here. But, uh, but yeah, so Brazil, uh, in, 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 the, in the sample that I'm looking at, Brazil, there is a higher uh, portion of the population that are working in agriculture, than, much higher than there is in South Africa. And when I did this decomposition of change of within group improvement and shifting, there was a, a big portion of Brazil's improvement was explained by within agricultural worker groups. So I agree that's a great point, and, I, and I'm glad that you brought it up. And uh, it also goes towards this example, uh, this question of you know what do we learn by looking at the comparison? Where here is something where there's a, a big improvement in one country that, that didn't really happen in the other country. So maybe we can learn something about that as far as answering you know what other routes to improvement uh, with these different structural change uh, might might take place. Um, what do we learn from the comparison? Can I summarize it in one sentence? Probably not, but I'll try in, in a four or five. Let's say. So, I mean, one thing is, is sort of the, 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 the example that the, uh, that the other questioner just brought up of, okay, so we can look at, okay, here's one way that there was improvement in Brazil that there wasn't in South Africa. Maybe there's something interesting here. Um, and another, another thing we could take away is something that I brought up actually in, in the conclusion of how, okay, so we saw in South Africa there was a big improvement in uh, a big, one of the big sources of improvement was a shift towards low productivity urban workers. And in Brazil, there was a, a major source of improvement from within that group of low productivity urban workers. So maybe there's something hopeful here that this will work and, and we can hope that but I, South Africa could look at how these workers have improved in Brazil and try to do the same thing, maybe. But uh, I think a bigger takeaway perhaps um, related to the original question of what, what is, is, does these new patterns of structural change matter for well-being, I think in both countries we could see that um, these urban high productivity workers, which is basically manufacturing, are doing better than these other groups of urban workers that I'm talking about, the low productivity workers. And also in both cases, there's almost no uh, uh, contribution of change of a shift towards those types of work. Right? So at the very least, I think we can look at that and say, maybe these new patterns of employment really do matter in a way that are affecting people's well-being, and, and that might be an interesting thing to, uh, to learn more about. Thanks. Uh, hello. So there were two uh, questions. Uh, the first related to estimation and the one to the overemployed. So just on the estimation note, the purpose of the paper was specifically to compare income decomposition uh, techniques and using the South African case study of the expansion of social grants. Uh, the main reason for that focus was pretty much based on the last technique, the Barros approach, which or originally is published in Portuguese and probably because of that hasn't received much attention in the literature uh, while the others have. And so the purpose of the, the focus of this paper was to pretty much bring that to light and draw attention to that while comparing it to other techniques and show that there's been great strides made in this literature. Uh, because of that, we haven't focused on any estimation approach as you suggested, but I think that would be the natural next step is to compare these techniques to an estimation type approach. And then finally, I believe there was some confusion over the overemployed. Um, maybe this is just a result of rushing through the presentation. It is not the overemployed, but one over the employed, so as a fraction. And so changes in the proportion of individuals in a household of adults, sorry, changes in the a proportion of adults that are employed in the household has resulted in changes in inequality, but not necessarily the overemployed. That's a different subject matter altogether. Thanks. Can I come in? Yeah. Um, so, quick commercial on Yuka's uh, point about the taxes, the tax side of it. There is a big study that's that's looking at the sort of taxes and the incidence and uh, uh, the impact, the redistributive impact of these social transfers. Um, that's not really the literature that we locked into here, it, but it is happening. It, it is obviously very, very important um, uh, component to all of these, uh, all of these studies. Um, yeah. So there was a comment about the uh, volatility of these index scores on different surveys, and I think that's a fair comment, and I think that one thing which I didn't stress enough towards the end of my presentation, I had it right up front, is that uh, it goes back to the point that 
you actually really want to interrogate the indices before you use them. I mean, I guess there are too many people who are just quite happy to to smash things together and run with it, and I, I think that's a problem. You know, so they they have their use. Uh, and the last thing that I want to to encourage is an equally uncritical smash things together and hope for the best. And now you can also calculate genies on them. <laughs> uh, that could lead to a lot of really dubious papers, uh, unfortunately. So I don't want to encourage that. I just want to say that there is actually a possibility of thinking through some issues which uh, we, we might not have been able to do beforehand. On the question of the rural stuff, uh, or more generally the public versus private assets, that is actually a really interesting question. And I, I, I think that it really goes to the heart of what you think of, a, of an asset. So I think that if one wants to do what I advocate here, then you really have to be quite clear in your own head as to what, what is an asset for a, for a household. And I think that the uh, Philman Pritchard approach actually was quite agnostic. You know, you see what works, you know, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's um, in anything effectively is, is game. You can basically uh, building materials and uh, and I think that uh, it's not clear to me that, that that kind of completely agnostic approach is right if you're wanting to think about who's got stuff and who hasn't got stuff, if that's ultimately what, what, what you're interested in. So then I would say kind of like which types of infrastructure, if you're talking about public assets, really behave like assets to households. You know, if you have a tap inside your house, is that really an asset? And that probably is. If you've got a connection, electricity connection in your house, is that really an asset for that household? Yes or no? Probably. But there's a whole bunch of other things which are probably not assets in, in that kind of uh, uh, con context. Uh, the stuff about land tenure, I think that's really, I'm going to cry off there because I think that was uh, really not, not in my stuff at the moment, but um, uh, I think that you may have a point, but uh, this is really not something I'm looking at at the moment. Uh, we have about five minutes left, so if somebody has a last one, two questions or comments, we can take that now. So it's uh, to Martin. Um, so now you said that everyone should use it carefully and all that, which I think is great. But um, my question is, like, you were cautioning about the potential problems of your approach, right? Mm -hmm. But then you mentioned them, I don't know if I got it wrong, but you mentioned them with respect to inequality, things that would seem a bit like it's just the distance between those that have and those that have not. But, like, to use it as a proxy for wealth, what, what is, I didn't get, what is, what is the problem in principle? So if it satisfies the actions that you said, which to me seems sensible, what, what is the problem? Yeah. yeah, so that's something I actually had to cut out in my rush to try and finish at least within a minute of the closing time. Uh, so the, the, the real problem is that, that the normalization that that Banerjee procedure does, if an asset is scarce, um, it gets a much higher weighting, which for some things seems right. But, I mean, if, if you do it on certain assets, for example, motorcycles are very scarce. So they actually get an insanely high score if you actually put, put a motorcycle in there in such a way that actually you'd say that can't possibly be the right score because it still works at the end of the day. Uh, it's, it's not a standard correlation. It's as correlation on the uncentered variables. But if you weight the motorcycle up to that extent that effectively somebody has a motorcycle, they will be at the top of the thing pretty much regardless of anything else they have. And then that seems wrong, which is... Um, and I guess that that's the problem with any automated procedure. If you're essentially letting the computer make certain decisions for you, um, there's going to be some context in which it it's going to create garbage. Uh, and that's, I guess, why I do want to, to caution people before that this thing takes off. Uh, uh, 
Uh, yeah, just please keep it short. That's, okay, short. Um, my question is, uh, don't you think finally that um, the score you define can give the, the, high, the very, very high weight to uh, asset, which finally is not very important for the household? So that's true even of the Pritchard and Filmer stuff. Um, so, I mean, I guess the, the, the problem with any summary measure when, when you're effectively looking for a correlation structure inside the data is some things may be an indicator that somebody's doing well even if you think that particular asset is, uh, shouldn't have that weight. I mean, I guess there's sort of two ways of thinking about it. The best way of taking assets and converting it into a wealth score is if you had prices on them. You know, nobody would quibble if you actually had the price of the asset to use the price as the weight. Um, if you don't have prices, uh, then you're using something else. You're using essentially something internal to, to this, this, the structure, uh, that the, the way these things correlate with each other. And then you can find things that, that may be... Uh, a sign that these people are well off, whereas, but the thing that's actually picking it up itself is not very expensive, you know. So it may be a reliable sign of, uh, of, of the fact that the household's doing well, but it, it, the, the weight it's getting may, may not be right in, in terms of uh, uh, the, the price of that particular uh, asset. So in the uh, in, in the case that I, I looked at uh, on the DHS, the asset that gave me after a motorcycle the biggest kick was computers. And there I had no qualms in saying, well, that, that probably, in terms of prices, much higher than cars. So you'd say in terms of the relative prices, those are the wrong exchange rates. But in terms of what it symbolizes, probably everybody who had a computer almost definitely in South Africa would have been right at the top end of the, uh, uh, of the uh, income distribution. So, so that's the problem with, with, with these, these procedures is that, that they're actually you're kind of really relying on the fact that overall it gives you the right kind of ranking uh, and the right kind of scores even if in the detail it sometimes looks uh, odd. The, the thing that I guess I just have a problem with is when people put in things that are real assets, like horses with negative weights, you know, which actually does mean in South Africa that the poorest of the poor in the rural areas have nothing on anything, actually look better off than people who have those, 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 those assets. So uh, we've come to the end of the session. Uh, thank you to all four speakers for very interesting presentations, and thank you all for being here. So we now break for coffee and then reconvene in half an hour for the next uh, and the final session of the day.